Hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here talking to you all in the coveted after lunch presentation slot. Um, my name is Aaron. Uh, this is a paper that I wrote with Shazina, who's here on stage, and Miranda, who's right on the corner there in the aisle. Uh, we wrote this together at Upturn in Washington, D.C. Uh, last summer. And I just want to say a note about Upturn. We're um, a small nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Uh, our mission is advancing justice in the design, governance, and use of technology. Um, and naturally, that work requires that we work in close collaboration with civil rights organizations um, and advocates of different kinds. Um, and this paper didn't come out of the abstract. This paper arose from some genuine struggling with hard questions in our day-to-day -day work. Um, and I just want to emphasize that these are live questions, they're kind of urgent questions. And I just want to, before we talk about what we found or what we tried to find out, I just want to ground us in a couple ways that these questions are real and alive today. Oh, I'm standing in front of the presentation. These graphics are from a paper that um, I was a co-author on with some colleagues who are probably in this room, looking at how Facebook delivers advertisements on its platform. And I want to be clear that irrespective of the targeting choices that an advertiser uses, Facebook will look at the content of the ad and make a predictive judgment about who should see that ad. At the top, um, what you see is ads for top 30 country and hip hop genre music, and then the estimated fraction of white users in each of those audiences respectively. Again, this is despite the fact that we didn't target these groups. On the right, on the illustration that's probably too hard to read, in short, a job for a lumberjack who's going to go predominantly to white men, a job for a more entry level kind of supermarket job is going to go predominantly to black women, right? And these are kinds, these is exactly the kinds of patterns that we would expect to see in machine learning systems um, that take as inputs the world around us. Um, the text in the lower left-hand corner is in the left-hand corner here is language from a legal settlement uh, with civil rights organizations last year, in which Facebook committed to engaging with academics, researchers, civil society experts, et cetera, et cetera, to think about this problem specifically. That is to say, the nature of kind of skewed demographic results um, arising from how its ad delivery engine delivers ads. Um, so this is my first just mini thing to say, live question. I promise you there are people at this company thinking about this issue as we speak. Um, this is the cover page from a report um, that Airbnb issued recently with a consultant from the ACLU. Um, and this was in response to uh, black users of Airbnb in particular saying, we feel like we're actually getting rejected for housing accommodations a lot when we use this platform. Um, that became an issue, there was some independent study, and in response, one of the things that Airbnb promised to do is erect a permanent full-time product team, um, a data science team of engineers, data scientists, researchers, and designers whose sole purpose is to advance inclusion and root out bias. Now, if you work at Airbnb, and you're a data scientist, and your goal is to root out discrimination based on what the users on your platform are doing, you're going to run headlong into these same sorts of questions. So commonality between these two stories, um, large tech companies with large user bases um, have committed to addressing racial, gender, and other types of discrimination on their platform. And so that leads us very naturally to the question of when, why, and how should these companies be collecting or inferring sensitive attribute data? Um, those are hard questions to answer. And what we did to try to get some guidance in answering those questions is look to US law and practice. Specifically, US law and practice in the fields of credit, employment, and healthcare. And I want to give um, a clear disclaimer uh, that we appreciate the fragility and the limiting nature of these categories, um, both as they are put into US law and put into corporate practice. Um, they are the ones that operate in the world today in the literature we reviewed, but I really look forward to the next talk. Um, that will challenge that for us. So that said, I want to turn it over to Shazita to talk about our case studies. Uh, I'm going to give kind of the Cliff's Notes version of each of the three case studies Aaron mentioned, but if you want more of the rich historical context about the credit, employment, and healthcare um, case studies, please read our paper. 
So when it came to our credit case study, um, the operative laws here are the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which is, uh, relates to consumer lending, and the Home Mortgage Dis Disclosure Act for mortgage lending. Um, we found a sharp contrast in practice between these two types of lending. So for um, home mortgage data, there's strict data collection requirements for mortgage lending um, motivated by preventing redlining and other forms of discrimination. It's required to collect this data. However, when it comes to consumer lending, the practice is the opposite. So lenders are prohibited from collecting these data for fear that they would discriminate. Um, there are exceptions to this for voluntary self-testing, which we go into more in the paper. And what's important to note about some of the outcomes here in having access to this home mortgage um, sensitive attribute data is that over time, some scholars believe that lending to um, minorities and low-income communities increased. Um, and fair housing advocates really valued having access to this data for community activism. Um, something to note for all three of the case studies is that Having the data alone has not been proven to be, have a causal effect on change, yet it's vital to have these data to, in order to be able to uh, demonstrate that discrimination has even occurred. Um, so when it came to employment, we looked at Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, large employers are required to regularly collect these demographic data. And what we noticed was also that employment was a rare area where regulators um, have gestured at statistical tests or kind of rules of thumb um, to make sure that they're not discriminating. So some of the outcomes from having access to this data are there are decades of audit studies, both statistical audit studies and the more traditional kind of old school studies where um, employers are sent many resumes and kind of compare what the outcomes are. Um, that were able to demonstrate kind of occupational segregation against women and ethnic minorities. Um, however, a more recent meta-analysis has suggested that little has improved over the last 25 years. And then finally, when it comes to healthcare, this was a little different um, because we found that the motivation for collecting sensitive attribute data did not generally stem from a goal of complying with the law. Um, rather, across the healthcare industry, there's a more voluntary effort to collect these data because there's an acknowledgement that there are demographic disparities in healthcare provision. Um, and there are multiple ways these data are collected. So there's self-reporting by individuals, there's intake specialist observation, which can sometimes be based on visual observations or surname analysis, um, and then kind of a supplementary set of computational um, inference and probabilistic techniques as well. And again, over time, there have been narrowing healthcare disparities, and access to this data has enabled support for research and policy initiatives. I'm just going to give you the last slide here. Um, so this, the questions on the slide are some of the basic questions in the paper. Um, but what I want to leave you with, right, the so what from these case studies is it's a little unsatisfying. Like what we essentially found is that U.S. law and corporate practice uh, doesn't offer consistent guidance. Right? There's no underlying principle that points us in the right direction as to how we should be thinking about this. Um, I want to emphasize, though, what a 2003 analysis of um, racial disparities in healthcare is a big report. That report concluded that the presence of sensitive attribute data, and this is me paraphrasing, does not guarantee that subsequent positive action will be taken, but its absence virtually guarantees that no action will be taken. And so there's this continuing tension with the value of measurement um, in order to address disparities. I want to leave you all with kind of a strong on the ground sense from Washington DC working on this, which is that I know the answer to how this will all go. If there's not concerted action, the answer is the companies will do nothing. Because there is significant legal compliance, reputational, all kinds of risk to companies taking a, like action to try to collect or infer sensitive attribute data. And so the default path is nothing's gonna happen here, right? And even if that's the right path, I hope that we're taking that intentionally together. The other thing I wanna say is when I talk to advocates of all stripes about this, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? If I say, should Facebook guess your race, the answer is instinctively and, and viscerally no, for lots of different reasons. If I say, housing providers have had legal obligations to test their practices and make sure they're not discriminating. Shouldn't tech companies be held to a similar standard? The answer is yes. So the way that these questions are framed and your faith in the usefulness of these measures is really, really important. And so my closing, kind of our closing call to action to you all here is these are not questions that we can or should decide. However, I hope that the expertise in this room can inform advocates and communities thinking about the answers to these questions to balance the risks, the trade-offs, 
um, and the extent to which this is worthwhile. So with that, thank you.